Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Next up, um, we have Northumbria. Hi, I'm Leah, and this is Luke. And I'm going to talk you through our response to making data useful. Now, we envision data as something that can reinforce our connection to the past as much as it connects us to our future. Our project explores the link between memory and meaning using physical and look, uses digital technology as a way of use, imbuing physical objects with a greater narrative worth. Sorry. <laughs> So, through a series of smart tools and interactive maker's marks, we sought to link both the digital and the physical data in our lives, creating an act of engagement that strengthened our connection to our possessions and to our predecessors. Now, we're an interdisciplinary team. I do product and furniture design, and Luke does interactive media design. We, wanted to, we really, really wanted our project to reflect this. Now, our response... Um, we also saw parallels between the overwhelming mass of data, big data, in the sense that it was abstract. Sorry, this is great. In the sense that it created something overwhelming as opposed to abstract, and that kind of parallel that we saw between the overabundance of physical things in our lives that became readily, that became disposable. That's really useful. <laughs> That's great. That means you don't have questions. It's fine. <laughs> we saw that if possessions... Sorry, here we go. There we go. <laughs> we saw that if our possessions told us a little more about ourselves, if they reinforced our connection to our own sense of history and to our own past, then they'd be more inclined to be valued in the future. And they b we saw that Less, they become less disposable and less throwaway. And we wanted to link both, so use data and physical objects as a way, imbue physical objects with data and, <laughs> sorry, see them as objects, sorry, as a way of imbuing physical objects with greater material, uh, worth, value. In the past, maker's marks, hallmarks, and the artist's signature were, you, were used as ways to mark the handmade. However, these marks, these objects soon became valued for the marks themselves. And we saw that this was because of the, what makes objects precious was they've been hand-touched. That sense of history and place that came with them. We keep objects if we know the maker. We're more inclined to treasure Oh, sorry, we buy from farmer's markets so we meet the producer and we're more inclined to keep a son's painting than a stranger's. It's objects that tell us something about ourselves, that reinforce our connection to the physical place and to our, reinforce a sense of our own history. We wanted to bring this human fingerprint into the digital, to imbue an object with the value of an artist's signature and create something you didn't have to rely on another's evaluation to know its value. In short, we wanted to create a digital signature of the handmade. Thank you for that. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> Read this. Um, so yeah, then we decided to create a series of digitally active maker's marks. Um, these would allow the maker to be both identified and for the maker to choose what, what data they leave behind, their kind of like legacy, their imprint. 
So yeah, um, our first iteration of this idea used Gadgeteer. Um, it was kind of a way of us experimenting and kind of to, 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 to try the whole tangible uh, interaction of it, um, really. We then thought about the feedback, um, and we really liked the idea of a line graph. It was quite synonymous with a, a pulse, kind of giving life to the object itself. Um, so we looked at data as a tool for living um, by adding these, this like line graph, this uh, pulse to the, to the object, we're, we're giving it a life. Um, so the different tools would have sensors within them. So is that okay if you, yeah, if you open no, up? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, we experimented with uh, adding sensors to different tools. Um, so within this one, we've got an accelerometer. And we looked at adding different nodes within the tools. Um, and then adding footage uh, and imagery to that. Um, but it's important for us that the, uh, the maker um, chose what was important. We didn't want to just kind of record the whole process. We wanted the maker to be in charge of what data was meaningful and useful to them, allowing them to leave their legacy. They're, they were the ones in charge. So yeah, the, the final iteration of this was a phone app. But as ubiquitous uh, technology improves, it might be that um, that it could use augmented reality, for example. Um, but yeah, so, so we developed this app where you can interact with the different kind of line graphs or pulses of the tools and interact with the different uh, footage or imagery that is present within each, each line graph. Also, you can look at information about the maker, find out more information about them, um, kind of the, what, what a maker's mark was originally intended for. But yeah, uh, we've got a video that would kind of um, hopefully encapsulate what our service is that we'd like to play now, hopefully. Roll yeah, can we roll the video, please? <laughs> Object to be a passive store of data that acts as a testament to the handmade. Just to summarise now, I know we're running short of time, but so our service is something that connects people with the handmade. It gives them a sense of their own history and encourages them to leave a legacy in objects that are made valuable by the time that they have taken to create them. It places developing technology as the key to our future past and bridges the gap between high tech and handmade. We see a future where technology is ubiquitous, when even the most basic tools are able to remember their use. In this, the data they, um, and are valued for the data they store, for how they connect us with, us, with us, uh, the act of making, and the way they contextualize our own memories. Thank you very much. So would you like this? <laughs> Despite all those technical things. How's this? Okay. Okay. Hello. So I, I actually have a, a proper question this time, I think. Um, so Christopher Dresser was arguably the first industrial designer. Yes. And he tried to imbue industrially produced objects with the 
values of craft. Mm -hmm. and, and those objects are still carry his imprint, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he didn't create them. I, it, it, he, he, it wasn't his hand that made them. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious, you focused very much on handmade mm -hmm. and the traditional craft. And I'd, I'd just like to ask you, how do you see this possibly extending? Because I think it could to the digital artifacts and objects of today, which are depersonalized despite, despite the fact in sort of dresser's time, times 100, um, actually do emerge from the human hand, just not directly. Okay, yeah, well, we initially, we developed the service um, based on an individual who'd be making an object themselves. So we saw that a lot of future videos of, you know, a lot of tech future, uh, sorry, videos of the future, um, promoted quite a hands-off future, where, it, to my mind, they kind of maybe um, de, uh, was it, like, took away the significance of skills and they saw that they, I saw that from those that people were seen as kind of having this hands-off kind of lifestyle um, and saw that actually people were going to start to, to really value being hands-on because we need to be hands-on to, to switch off. You know, we, we, we need that process of making something with our hands to be able to really, really like get to that point where we don't think, <laughs> which I think is actually really valuable. Um, now, we initially developed this for an individual, uh, and then we saw that actually it would be quite appropriate, like you say, for a service, which is hence the, the, the application that we developed. Um, and I had a lot of questions earlier about people saying, well, well what happens if the person, you know, if, if they're a professional and they make 20 chairs? Do they embed, you know, the, the, each chair with the same data? Does that not cheapen it? And I said, well, no, because the individual is going to be making, you know, whether, whether they're a professional craftsperson, might make 20 chairs, the same chairs. And they, so that, you know, what, what if they do choose to embed the same data into each one? But we don't, like, value um, an artist or devalue an artist's prints because there's 20 of them. We still, it's that, connect, that connection to something that's, physic, that's handmade. Um, and it, because it's one of 20 as opposed to one of, like, 20,000, it does make it more, more I suppose, more uh, precious, more personal. I don't know if that answers your question. If you want to reframe it and Luke can answer it. <laughs> so you were asking about um, digital specifically um, and during. Was that the question? Can kind of, but uh, mostly I just, I like the idea and I want to see how it extends even further. But I yeah. don't want to hug the time, so I would rather oh, okay. give uh, these guys a chance. Um, I think, okay. I really like what you're doing, and I'm really, I, think it's, I think you're really missing something in the way you're presenting it, because it wouldn't have been difficult to simply video, really video yourselves making something and show the connection between what that really looks like and what you get from the object. And it feels, uh, it isn't really a criticism, because I think what you're doing is great. It's just that it comes over as very corporate, the way in which the kind of videos you're showing, even the kind of chair you're showing. And, I'm kind of curious, particularly in this kind of a situation with, is what does it mean to show stuff where people start actually believing in the content? And all you had to do was make stuff and video it, really make it, really video it, and then we get a sense of what that feels like when you connect the person back to the object. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> Did you want a response to well, that? Well, I'd, I'd be interested to know whether you have any doubts about the way and the type of furniture you've chosen and the type of video you've shown in connection. We, have you, um, this is going to be using. <laughs> this is me coming from my perspective as a product and furniture designer. Yeah. Um, I see that there's a massive trend at the moment, um, or a massive, I so suppose, resurgence in makers or, you know, uh, craftspeople creating videos that glorify or, I suppose, celebrate the making process. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily what's made, but it's that process. So through videos or through sites, which is kind of product by process and Vimeo and what have you, they are kind of celebrating their skills. Now, whilst me and Luke didn't show us actually, I suppose, like you say, physically making things on the, on the, um, <laughs> on, on the video, um, we did think that this was kind of a quite applicable to this kind of... We, we, we saw that makers would choose to embed 
video or what have you, just because it showed that very real nature of like what they were doing, that kind of hands-on. And yeah, yes, <laughs> I think I've just not answered your question. I think we wanted a service as well that was uh, personalised for each individual maker. I mean, what they leave uh, could be could be corporate, but maybe an, a different maker is more kind of more hand, you know craft based, handmade. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think we, we we foresaw a service that changed depending on who who was the maker really. Thank you so much.